Military murder is an independent project and is not endorsed by the Department of Defense or any military component. The views expressed are those of the host. The content of this podcast is not meant to be legal or medical advice. Warning, this episode contains graphic details of murder and is not suitable for young listeners. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome back, True Crime Army. I am your host, Margot, and this is Military Murder, a show where I discuss crimes committed by military members and veterans, and sometimes their spouses. But don't worry, you don't have to know anything about the military to listen, I promise. You just have to be a true crime enthusiast, and if that's you, welcome home. How are you today? Listen, this week, as you get ready to enjoy your holiday with family and friends, Hug everyone a little tighter because these episodes get really dark, but I hope they serve to remind you how precious life is and how we have to be thankful for our loved ones. This week, I am thankful for my entire family, but I'm also thankful for two years of this podcast and all of you. Thanks for tuning in every single week. And just a reminder, if you plan on road tripping soon, be sure to check out the fan club where for as little as $5, you can get access to every single episode completely ad-free. Plus, you get at least a dozen or more full-length bonus episodes to binge while you're traveling. I'll include a list of all the bonus episodes, meaning like the cases that I've covered to date in the show notes so that you can take a peek. Today's story is another senseless, and I mean senseless murder of an airman. We are heading west to Vegas to Nellis Air Force Base, Join me today as I tell you the story of Air Force Staff Sergeant Nathan Payette. Now, let's dig in. A quick thank you to listener and fan club member Stacy for helping to research and write this episode. For this episode, I got my true crime TV binge on because Nathan's story is so compelling that it was featured in IDTV's American Monster, Oxygen's Snapped, and a show called Sex, Lies, and Murder. Additional sources included CBS News, Las Vegas Review Journal, Las Vegas Sun, and Air Force Times. Nathan Joseph Villagomez Payet was born on February 2, 1982, to his mother Carmelita and father Mateo. He was born and raised on the island of Guam. Guam is a very small island that is only 210 square miles. The island is home to roughly 165,000 people. And for those of you who don't know, it is a U.S. territory, and it's located in the Pacific Ocean. As a territory of the U.S., the residents are U.S. citizens, and they're able to join the armed forces. But according to Stacy's research, they cannot vote in our elections. Anyway, Nathan was one of four kids. Growing up, Nathan was a good kid, always paid attention, and his teachers remembered he always sat in the front of the class and he barely missed a day of school. On the island, he was known for surfing and just loving the water, which makes complete sense. If I lived near the water, I'd spend every waking hour soaking in the sun and the waves. While in high school, Nathan met Michelle Antoinette Chaco, the girl that would become his future wife. They were teenagers, and as teenagers often do, When they find a love interest, they are attached at the hip. Michelle became Nate's little sidekick. They were besties and no one could separate them. Michelle was born to Marsha and Anthony. Michelle was beautiful and everyone thought she was a catch. Everyone either wanted to be her or wanted to date her. Michelle was also one of four kids and she had a really close-knit family. So when tragedy struck at a young age, it was rough on the entire family. You see, when Michelle was 16, her mother got really sick. Her mother was flown off the island for medical treatment, but she didn't survive, and the kids were unable to be at her side. Without the matriarch, sister Melissa became the mother figure, and she stepped up to help raise her siblings. She has said that Michelle was always such a huge help to her with household chores and just helping around the house after her mother passed. After high school graduation, Nate proposed to Michelle. Nate and Michelle worked to make ends meet and soon discovered they were expecting their first baby. At the time, Nate was working in a hotel, but he was definitely not making enough money to support a family of three. So in 2002, he decided to join the military. 
and he decided on the Air Force. Nate attended training and his first duty assignment was in Anchorage, Alaska, a place where the summer days are long and the winter nights are longer. While at Elmendorf Air Force Base, the Payettes welcomed their second child. And it was at this assignment when they finally got married and had a wedding. They were stationed at Elmendorf for the better part of four years, which is a significant amount of time. But soon the time would come to move again. And this time they were heading to Arizona. According to the Las Vegas Sun, in 2007, the family PCS'd again. PCS, for those of you who don't know, just means a move. And this time, they were heading just a little north to Nellis Air Force Base, which is very close to Las Vegas, Nevada. Nate was the F-15 fighter jet supply section technician assigned to the 757th Aircraft Maintenance Squadron. Okay, so now the year is 2009, and the Payettes are now a family of six. They have four beautiful children. The life that Nathan and Michelle created for their family is amazing. And Nate celebrates by buying a family house in Mountain's Edge, a community in the unincorporated town of Enterprise, roughly 25 miles from base. At the time, Michelle was a stay-at-home mom, so Staff Sergeant income was not enough for the family to live a lavish life. It was enough to survive, but Nate and Michelle wanted more. So Nate put in for a deployment because with deployments come extra money. And he also wanted to feel like he was doing his part in the military. And at this time, Michelle picked up a job outside the home as well. But while her husband was getting prepared for his deployment to Iraq, Michelle was freaked out by the thought of her husband being deployed. Heck, what would happen to her and the four kids if something happened to Nathan? Michelle spoke about her fears to her sister, but she was assured that he would be just fine. And us military folk, we get it. We freak out, but we convince ourselves that everything's going to be fine and nothing bad will happen to us. Soon, Michelle started her part-time job as a telemarketer at EIN Credit Inc. Nate was gone for six whole months. And while some days seemed to move like molasses, everyone blinked and boom, Nathan was back home and their perfect little family of six was whole again. All that worrying that Michelle had done was for naught because her high school sweetheart and father to her four kids was back. And now they had the extra money and Michelle was contributing her own extra income from her job. And to top it off, Michelle was working towards her side hustle. She was going to school to become a beautician. By now, the Payette kids ranged in ages from two to nine years old. So we all know it was never a dull moment in their home. And to top it off, when Nathan returned from deployment, he was put on night shift. So while his entire family slept, Nate would wake up, put on his uniform, and work through the wee hours of the night into the morning. His shift began at 11.30 p.m. But on December 1st, 2010, he'd never arrive to work. Have you ever wondered what it would be like to have a therapist, someone that you could talk to in a judgment-free zone? Maybe you have thought about it, but you were scared away by the thought of taking the first step, or maybe you thought therapy wasn't affordable. Try Talkspace. By doing virtual therapy, Talkspace has made getting people help easy, accessible, and affordable. Y'all don't know this, but some things in my life recently have really gotten me down. I wasn't quite sure how to get out of the funk. I wasn't sure how to get back up. So I figured I would try therapy because I was sure that it would definitely not make things any worse. And I'm so glad that I tried it. I have found new coping mechanisms to deal with stress and I'm now looking forward to my future. Talkspace makes it easy to find a therapist that you like and it's so convenient to do everything from the comfort of wherever you are because life sometimes gets hectic. Sometimes I take my calls in my office, sometimes I take my calls in the car. Life is mobile and therapy should be too. At Talkspace.com, you can sign up online and get a personalized match with a provider that's right for you. And it's typically done within 48 hours. Talkspace is the number one online therapy platform with licensed therapists in over 40 specialties, including anxiety, depression, relationship issues, and much more. And right now, as a listener of this show, you'll get $100 off your first month with Talkspace when you go to Talkspace.com slash military murder. To match with a licensed therapist today, visit Talkspace.com slash Military Murder to get $100 off your first month. 
and to show your support for the show. That's Talkspace.com slash Military Murder. HBO Max presents Love and Death. It is human nature to take risks. Would you be interested in having an affair? Starring Elizabeth Olsen and Jesse Plemons. You need to be careful. Betty Gore was murdered by someone she knew. The new Max original limited series, Love and Death, premiering April 27th on HBO Max. The truth has a way of coming out. Listen to the official Love and Death podcast wherever you get your podcasts. On December 1st, 2010, Nate was supposed to be at work at 11.30 p.m. The airman he was supposed to replace was at work waiting for Nate, but when he didn't show up at 11.30 p.m., she called their supervisor. Meanwhile, Nate had just woken up later than expected. He jumped out of bed in a fright, realizing he was late for work. He flew around the house getting his uniform on and getting ready to leave. And he called work to let them know that he was running late and there was no way he'd be there by 11.30 p.m. Nate was a habitual creature. He'd put his uniform on inside. Then he'd head to the garage where he sat on his exercise bench to put his military boots on. On this night, he was in the garage putting on his boots with the garage door open when all of a sudden, two random men approached him at gunpoint. They told Nate to come with them, but Nate was concerned about his family. So instead of going with them, he turned to run into the house, and that's when gunshots rang out. Nate opened the door to his house, his wife and four kids inside, and that's when they saw that Nate had been shot. As he walked in, he collapsed to the floor as his children watched. Nathan lay inside his home dying. He had been shot five times in the back. Michelle tried to save her husband's life and she called 911 sobbing that her beloved Nate had been shot. The police and ambulance rushed to the house on the 9200 block of Altamonte Court near Mountain Edge Parkway in Durango Drive. When they arrived, Nathan was still alive. The paramedics rushed him to University Medical Center, but he later succumbs to his injuries. The community was devastated. They were devastated to hear about Nathan's murder. And Michelle and the kids, they were completely broken. Imagine a family losing their father, a wife losing her husband. Yeesh, she was afraid that he'd die in Iraq. She didn't think he would die in their cush little neighborhood. Mountain's Edge is a quiet community. Crime like that doesn't happen there. In fact, people move to this community to get away from crime. So what gives? Police immediately start investigating and they start with Michelle. Michelle tells them everything. Nate was running late. He went outside. She heard gunshots. She didn't see anything. Then Nate came inside and that's when he had been shot. Detectives don't press too hard because she is devastated. They do a ton of knock and talks to see if anyone heard or saw anything. It was late, close to midnight when the shots rang out. And many neighbors said they were inside, they didn't see anything or heard anything out of the ordinary besides gunshots. But detectives get lucky when they find a neighbor who saw something. A neighbor was outside walking his dog. When he heard the gunshots, he quick turned and saw a suspicious person get into a black Cadillac CTS, driving out of the cul-de-sac with its headlights off. Police asked Michelle to return for more questions. And that's when they ask her if she knew anyone who drove a Cadillac CTS. Michelle starts to think about it. And in fact, she does know someone, one of her coworkers, a man named Michael Rodriguez. Detectives are curious. They ask her if she ever had anything to do with this guy. Were, were they friends? Were they more than friends? And Michelle says, no, no, no. Nate was the love of her life, she assures them. Police are not really buying it. And they ask her if she's ever flirted with guys at work. And maybe one of them got the wrong impression. And it's during this line of questioning that she finally admits that, yes, she has flirted with coworkers and Michael Rodriguez was one of those coworkers. Michelle further admitted that while Nathan was deployed, she allowed Michael to flirt back with her and he would buy her lunches and dinners and she loved the attention he would shower on her. However, she stated that after Nathan returned home, she forgot all about Michael. Police are intrigued. They run a background check on this Michael Rodriguez and they find that Michael is a two-time felon. He spent time in prison in 2007 for forgery and in 2008, he spent time in prison for attempted theft. Anyway, Michael was known to be somewhat of a player in and out of work, meaning he loved the ladies. He was known as a Rico Suave at work. 
police call Michael down to the station for questioning and they ask him what he was doing the night of December 1st. And Michael admits, not so shyly, that he was in a hotel with a former porn star. (laughs) Well, actually, he says that he was at a local Walmart alone when he bumped into an ex-porn star. They got to chatting and he convinced her to go on a date with him. He said they went to the airfield and watched the planes land and take off for a while. And I've known folks stationed at Nellis who have done this. And in fact, Stacy, who helped me with this episode, she tells me that there's a popular spot in this area for people to hang out because you look directly at Las Vegas Strip as you're watching the planes. Anyway, Michael claimed that after watching the planes, he got a room at Sunset Station and he spent the night doing the hibbity jibbity with his new lady friend. And Michael wasn't lying. He actually had proof because while they were there, they made a homemade tape of their adult activities. The police kind of laugh and they're like, "Okay." they check his alibi. They called the lady friend, asked her what she did on December 1st, and she confirmed Walmart, airplane watching, hibbity jibbity. And with that, police were back at square one. They had to find out who killed Nathan Payette. American hero, father to four, and husband. The Las Vegas media were blasting information about Nathan's murder all over the news. They were asking the public for help. Meanwhile, Nathan's family was coming into town from all over the world. Nellis Air Force Base and all of Nathan's co-workers, they were reeling over his murder as well. And the base was organizing a memorial. And then on December 7th, the woman from Walmart showed up at the police station again. She had something she wanted to get off her chest. On December 7th, 2010, six days after Nathan's murder, Michael's alibi came crumbling down when his lady friend called the Las Vegas Homicide Department and said she needed to talk. She went down to the station and told them quite the tale. And this is what she said. She said in late November, one of her friends, Jessica Austin, called and asked her for a favor. Jessica asked her if she would serve as Michael's alibi. Jessica told the woman that Jessica's boyfriend, Corey Hawkins and Michael Rodriguez, they were going to rob a heroin distributor after a drug deal gone wrong. The woman didn't really mind being an alibi for this since they were ripping off a bad guy anyway. So wait, before I continue, let me tell you a little bit about this Jessica chick's boyfriend. Corey Hawkins, Jessica's boyfriend, was also a felon. In fact, he was a nine-time convicted felon. He had been convicted of burglary and possession of a stolen car in 95, attempted grand larceny in 96, robbery with use of a deadly weapon in 2000, and fraudulent use of a credit card in 2006. Corey and Michael actually became friends when they met in prison. Okay, so back to the story. So this Jessica chick was going to be Corey's alibi because that was her boyfriend and they lived together. But the trio needed an alibi for Michael. And this girl was the perfect fit. And they never name her. So that's why I just call her this girl or the blonde girl, the Walmart girl, the hibbity jibbity girl. Well, this lady, she immediately agreed because she was going to receive a cut of the money for providing this alibi. The woman told the police that she didn't feel guilty about her part in the scheme. Because as I said earlier, it was a heroin addict or distributor that was scamming people. So she basically thought, screw that guy. And this is what she said happened on December 1st. Her, Jessica, Michael, and Corey were all hanging out at Jessica and Corey's apartment on the 2500 block of North Green Valley Parkway in Henderson when the guys left to rob the drug guy. While the women were waiting at the home for the men to return, Jessica received a call from Corey asking her to do a few things. Jessica built a fire in the home's fireplace, and when the men returned, they immediately took off their clothes and burned them in the fireplace. The guys also destroyed their cell phones, and they destroyed this woman's cell phone. They told the woman if she got called in by the cops to lie and not mention a thing. The woman and Michael immediately beelined to the hotel to secure his alibi, and they were in fact caught on CCTV footage. The woman was not feeling guilty at all about what happened until she was called into the police the first time and discovered that an airman had been murdered. Then she saw it all over the news and she began to feel like she may have actually been helping a murderer. And she was not okay with that. She also admitted that the day following her alibi, 
she returned to Corey and Jessica's house and it smelled of bleach. Armed with this new information, detectives call Michelle Payette back to the station. Nathan's cousin had escorted her down to the station that day. While Michelle is at the station, the Air Force is hosting a memorial service for Nathan. But at the memorial service, Michelle is nowhere to be found. Nate's family and close friends, they believe that maybe Michelle is too distraught to make an appearance. But no one knows that she's back at the police station being grilled about her possible involvement in her husband's murder. The detectives knew that Michelle's story just wasn't adding up. And they wondered if there was more to Michelle's relationship with Michael than she was letting on. After much questioning, Michelle realized that she just needed to fess up to her relationship with Michael. She told detectives that while her husband was deployed, she was feeling lonely. She admitted that Nathan was an amazing man, but he didn't treat her the way she wanted to be treated. He didn't do anything bad or mean. He just didn't do anything extra. She was upset because he didn't compliment her enough. He wasn't uber affectionate. And well, once he was deployed, boom, she turned to Michael for everything that she was missing. And they began an affair. Michelle told detectives that at some point while Nathan was still deployed, Michael started talking insurance money. Michael told Michelle that if something happened to Nathan, that Michelle would inherit a $400,000 life insurance policy. But Michelle reminded him, Nate had an additional $250,000 insurance policy on his life. The insurance money was a running joke between Michelle and Michael. Much like a normal person who plays a lottery may envision spending their winning jackpot money, this mother of four and her felon boyfriend, they would joke about how they would commit the perfect murder so that they could run off and be together without her pesky husband interfering. And let's not forget, $650,000 richer. But Michelle assured the detectives that she thought it was just talk between two lovers she had no idea there would actually be a crime or that there would be an actual murder. When the questioning was done that day, Michelle was allowed to leave and Nathan's cousin was there to take her to Nate's memorial service at Nellis Air Force Base. But before Michelle got into the car, she fell to her knees and started crying. Right there in the middle of the police department parking lot, Michelle had a mental breakdown and she was escorted to a mental institution because she kept telling everyone she wanted to kill herself and she blurted out everything that happened. After Michelle was escorted to the hospital, arrest warrants were issued for Jessica Austin, Michael Rodriguez, and Corey Hawkins, and they were arrested in connection with the plot to kill Nathan Payette. Within a few days, Michelle was released from the hospital, but she was taken into police custody immediately and charged with the murder of her husband. And it was at this point that both Nathan's family and Michelle's family were blindsided by the charges. It was as if they had been gut punched. They understood a mental breakdown, but they had no idea that their beloved Michelle, a woman who had been in Nathan's life since they were kids, the woman who mothered four of their children could be capable of such evil. And for the most part, the families stuck by Michelle's side, believing she was just another one of Michael Rodriguez's victims. But at trial, the real evil would be revealed. Michael Rodriguez was the first to stand trial. He confessed that he was the trigger man. He made it clear that he and Michelle were in this together. They talked about the murder multiple times and Michelle promised Michael $150,000 for killing her husband. But not just the money. According to prosecutors, Michelle would manipulate this man with sex as a way to persuade him to help her get rid of her husband. Michael, in turn, kind of, sort of, in a way, contracted out his alibi and the getaway car. From his cut, he would pay out Corey, Jessica, and the alibi witness. And Michael had a plan. They had various plans, but the one that they really were going to stick with was they wanted to kidnap Nathan on his way to work, take him to the desert, and instill, quote, fear, torture, and pain along the way, end quote. Then they were going to kill him and leave his body in the desert. But 
we all know that best laid plans don't always go as desired. And Nathan was no punk. Michael thought that Nathan would succumb and follow them as soon as they pointed a gun in his face. But Nathan, instead, likely thinking about his family, ran towards the house. And this is why Michael shot him in the back. And then he had to flee the scene. And well, even though Michelle kept claiming that she had nothing to do with Michael's actual plan, a deep dive into her cell phone records revealed she set her husband up to walk right into an ambush that night. And then she laughed about it. Get this, phone records revealed that on that evening when Nathan was running late to work, Michelle sent a text message to Michael stating, quote, sorry, took my meds and was asleep. My husband just woke me up and he's trying to rush out the door. I guess he's late, LOL, end quote. Then she texted, quote, can't go back to sleep right now. Got woken up from a man screaming, I'm late. He's rushing to get out the door, LOL, end quote. And for those of you who don't know, LOL means laugh out loud. Then after Nathan was shot and after he was taken to the hospital where he later died from his gunshots, Michelle Payette had the audacity to send one more message to Michael. It was a simple emoji, a smiley face, that evil b****. Excuse my language, but honestly, there is no other word to better describe this woman. And the text messages between the two discussing the murder plot, they were perfectly captured on Michelle's phone. While she played the sad, sad widow, her week-long plans were finally coming to fruition. And the text messages about murdering Nate, they dated back to October. So this was not a spur-of-the-moment type of thing. They actually planned and plotted this poor man's death. After all the evidence was discovered, it's not surprising to learn that Michael Rodriguez was convicted of Nathan's murder. In October of 2016, Michelle went to trial for her part in her husband's murder. Prosecutors were seeking the death penalty, but knowing the evidence against her was so strong, Michelle instead entered into a plea agreement. She pled guilty in exchange for removing the death penalty from possible sentence. Michelle somehow was hoping to be given life with the possibility of parole. But the judge had absolutely no sympathy for the woman who, quote, orchestrated a plot that left her husband dying in his blood-soaked Air Force fatigues in front of their four children, end quote. That's right. The four Payette kids were scarred from witnessing their father's murder, which I cannot even begin to fathom. According to the Las Vegas Review Journal, Carmelita Villa Gomez Payet, Nathan's mother, she told the judge that her boy was, quote, an obedient and respectful son, end quote. She prayed for him while he served in Iraq a year before his death, stating, quote, he survived deployment in a war zone only to die at the hands of his wife, end quote. Carmelita also told the judge that Michelle's kids are scared of her, commenting that they fear she might come after them. The prosecutor said some pretty poignant things about Michelle. As Michelle sat at the defense table crying while she heard everyone speak, prosecutor Michelle Fleck made sure to tell the judge to not be fooled, stating, quote, she sits before you as she has before other men, crying and kind of the perfect picture of femininity and vulnerability, looking like a victim. What you see is not what you get, end quote. Michelle begged the judge for mercy, saying, quote, I made a huge mistake and a really bad choice, end quote. Girl, please, dyeing your hair purple or getting an atrocious tattoo, that's a bad choice. Killing the father of your four kids is way, way beyond that. The judge, of course, sentenced Michelle to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Ultimately, Michael Rodriguez and Corey Hawkins also received life sentences without the possibility of parole. Jessica pled guilty to conspiracy, but I was unable to find out her final sentence. Reports indicate that the Payette kids are being raised by Nate's family in Guam. I want to end this episode with remembering Nathan Payette because in all of the documentaries that I watched about Nathan, you can feel what a genuinely nice guy he was. 
The Las Vegas Sun wrote an article about the memorial service hosted in Nate's memory the week after he was gunned down. And I want to share some of those words here with you today. Nathan was remembered for always having a smile and for having a contagious attitude. One of his coworkers said of Nate, quote, Nate was well loved and did so many good things, and I'm sure he'll do so much more in heaven, end quote. Nate's brother, Eric, remembers during the episode of American Monster, not really wanting to go to the memorial service because it was just too painful. But he knew he had to be there to represent for his brother because that's what his brother would have wanted. And during the memorial service, Eric Payette said, quote, Today, our family found out how much he was loved by others. I can't imagine anybody who would not want to be his friend, who would not want to live the way he lived, end quote. In a joint family release, the Payette family said, quote, We are saddened by the loss of Nate, and it is impossible to comprehend why someone would harm him. He was a wonderful person who was loved by so many and will be forever missed and never forgotten, end quote. This case hit me hard, as they all do, but as a mother and a wife with a husband who loves his kids, I cannot imagine being so evil that I would voluntarily take my kid's father away from them. If you hate your husband so much and need money, why don't you get a divorce and get a job? And this just makes me so angry. Nathan was truly loved by all of his family and friends. One of his coworkers, in fact, reached out to me to ask me to cover his case. And this person shared with me that Nathan used to actually talk about his wife and kids all the time during turnover at work. And he'd actually mentioned to his coworker, quote, how proud he was of Michelle for going to college, end quote. Nathan Payette, may you rest in peace, brother. True Crime Army, if you want to continue to hear these stories, be sure to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts so you never miss an episode. And make sure you follow me on TikTok. My handle there is Military Margot with a T. And on TikTok, I release about two or three mini episodes a week some that I've covered on the podcast and some that I have not. Also, from now on, I plan on releasing a TikTok on the weekly case that I cover every Monday. So if you want to see pictures from the cases and from today's case, make sure that you follow me on there. This show was created by Mama Margot Productions and produced in collaboration with my Bootcamp and Hire fan club members. This month's executive producers are Nicole G, Falcon 13, Tina S, Alicia H, and Ryan R. Our newest associate producer this month is Catherine O. Our newest assistant producers are Evelyn B, Brandy G, Sarah H, and JM. And a quick shout out to our new November dotted line contributors, Krista C, Aneda T, Karina W, Shelly LG, Lynette G, and Mindy Easterwood. The music was created by Tyops. Until next time, remember, you never really know what someone is capable of. So remain vigilant always. You have a fabulous week, and I'll keep digging to bring you another military murder story next week. Shh, let's work on our podcast.